My name is Clancy Ibbislin, and I'm an alcoholic. And you just don't know how good it is to be a Norwegian Lutheran coming home from California. <laughs> All those Catholics and Episcopalians and Presbyterians and other losers. Well, <clears throat> I'm very glad to be here today, safe and sane and sober, as I like to say. And I want to. I'm here kind of not as a lecturer to le lecture you on the singleness of purpose, but to explain a little bit about what was just read for us. You know, most of us are familiar with uh, the singleness of purpose. We hear about it a lot, and, and people around the world wonder why we get so involved in it, because, you know, he's, there are so many people who have so many problems that would be helped by our program, and why do we make such a big fuss that you have to be an alcoholic to be an Alcoholics Anonymous, and such a singular uh, approach. And it really it goes back to the history of AA, really. And once you hear about it, I think you'll understand it. Most of us are familiar with the story of uh, alcoholism being untreatable for many years, for, for like 4,000. <laughs> and then this guy, rich guy, went to uh, Europe and went to this doctor's office in Switzerland. and there for a year and the doctor said I think you're okay now and he sent him home and got as far as Paris and got drunk <laughs> he came back and he refused to let him back in the hospital they said why Dr. Young he, uh, he didn't mean any harm he just got drank too much he said I, I realized I misdiagnosed his case I thought he had deep psychological problems I could help him with but I see now that he is what is known as a chronic alcoholic and to the best of my knowledge, there's no effective treatment for that condition in the world at any price. That was a, just 1931, not very long ago. And so he came home, and he, uh, on the way home, I guess this time, he, he surrendered to the fact he was helpless and hopeless and on the ship. And he got home, and he, he de decided to stay sober. He wrote later, I wanted to stay sober as long as I could, so when I die drunk, my parents will have a pleasant memory of me. <laughs> and he really meant it because nobody stayed sober. But, and uh, someone told him about the Oxford group. We hear that a lot about AA, about the Oxford group. A lot of people don't know what the Oxford group is. In the late 1910s, about 1908, a Lutheran minister, I'm happy to say, <laughs> in Pennsylvania, felt that there was too much lackness in the, so, the church. People were not dedicated enough. He said, like, at one time, they'd be willing to be crucified for the faith. Now you couldn't even get them to come to church when it rained. You know, just terrible. And so he started an organization called the First Century Christian Association with some determination. And he didn't get many people joining up. <laughs> you can bet on that. Oh, I, I don't think I want to be crucified this year, Reverend. I'll talk to you about it. <laughs> but after the Second World, after the First World War, he went to Europe and tried to talk it up in Europe and got nothing but rejection. But of all places, the students at Oxford University were thought it was just wonderful. Isn't this grand? And they all got involved in it and just so much so that it changed the name of the organization to the Oxford Group. And he came back in the late 1920s, and now we have the Oxford Group ages uh, approval with him. And pretty soon Oxford Groups formed all over America, but not in the way he had created it. It turned out to be better type people meeting in one another's homes and discussing how they could enhance their spirituality. And so uh, he heard about the Oxford group, this guy that had gone to New, uh, Switzerland. So he decided to go there and see if that would help. And he got caught up in it, was, loved it. And after a while, he went up to Vermont on vacation and found another childhood friend of his, this Ebby, who was about to be sent to the penitentiary. He talked to the judge and said, Judge, let me bring him back to New York and put him in the Oxford. Maybe that'll help him. So the judge said, OK. And so Ebby was, became in the Oxford group. And Ebby didn't really like the Oxford group, but it's better than the Vermont Penitentiary, so he stayed here. <laughs> and he, uh, <clears throat> after a few months of being in the Oxford group, one day Roland came by Ebby and said, well, time for your identification. I said, what the hell is that? He says, after we're doing well, we try to find someone in the community and testify to him what we found. And Abby said, I don't want to do that. That's embarrassing. He said, you want to go back to Vermont? No, I believe I'll testify. <laughs> and so he thought, who could I testify to? And he went through a bunch of names. And he remembered another childhood friend of his who was a bigger mooch than he was. 
And he thought, that drunken fool, he won't even remember it if I tell him. So he called up Bill Wilson in Brooklyn. And our book talks about Bill, talks about coming to the door, and there's Ebby, sober, clean cut. He said, gee, Ebby, you look great. What have what you been up to? He said, I found religion. That ended Bill's interest in the conversation. <laughs> and I heard Ebby talk about this at the International Convention of 1960. He went a little further than Bill does in the book. He, they sat down at the table, and he tried to tell Bill about the Oxford group, and Ebb, Bill drank as fast as he could. That's very really great. That's really good, Ebby. <laughs> And he left, and, and something else happened. Ebby came back in about three days, and he had the Oxford group closer with him. And, Howie, Mr. Wilson, I want to tell you a little bit about Oxford. And Bill, true to the code, got drunker than ever. And that was the end of that. Well, the following November, 1934, thereabouts, uh, late 1943, 44, Bill uh, got thinking about that. You know that goofy Ebby meant well, but he's a goof, but he meant well. I, sh I, should, I should have been nicer to him. So he decided to go over where Ebby was staying in a mission on Broadway in New York, in Manhattan. I'll go over there and apologize to him. So he went over there in early November of 1934, got drunk on the way just to build up his strength, and <laughs> got to the mission. Ebby wasn't there, but he gave a short sermon to everyone to help him and staggered on down the street, and a day or two later, he was back in the hospital again. But this time, it was kind of an unusual trip back to the hospital, because this time he was dying. And the doctor called up his wife and said, Mrs. Uh, Wilson, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I don't think your husband has another one of these drunks in him. If he doesn't stop drinking after this one, I'm afraid he's going to die. There's nothing we can do. And Lois was upset. She called up Abby at the Mission said, can you go up and see Bill? He may be dying. And so Abby took a few friends and went up to the hospital, tried to talk to Bill. You know, Bill, all you have to do is find a power greater than yourself. I don't want to hear that religious crap. Okay, they went home. And Bill lay there and went to sleep, apparently, and woke up at midnight and his heart was pounding. And he knew he was going to die. And he shouted, if there's a God there, show yourself! He said, all of a sudden, the lights went on in the room, like somebody threw a switch. And there was some wind blowing through closed windows. He thought, I'm having a psychiatric breakdown. My God, I'm going crazy. <laughs> and, but he felt good. And uh, he lay there for a while, and pretty soon the lights went out, and the wind stopped blowing. And he went to sleep and slept well, first time in a long time. In the morning, he told the doctor, I said, doctor, I, I guess I had a psychiatric breakdown. I'm, the doctor looked him in the eye and said, I don't know what's, what happened to you, Bill, but you're a different person. Whatever you found last night, hang on to it. So he hung on to it. And he associated with Ebby. Some Ebby said, I must not heard. So he went over and joined the Oxford group. And the interesting thing is he thought he had a mission to help drunkards like himself stay sober. And he went to Oxford group meetings every day and on his way, he'd pick up some street drunk and bring him in. You know, <laughs> these nice people sitting around. <laughs> I believe you're vomiting on my shoes, sir. <laughs> and he tried to help them, and he'd take them home. And one of them committed suicide in his living room. I mean, he just, if they had no place to go, he'd take them to his house and talk to them. And after six months of this, one morning he got up and he went out to get a cup of coffee and the guy he had brought home the night before had disappeared and taken the coffee pot <laughs> to sell for wine, apparently. And he looked to his wife, who was getting ready for work, and she had been a chic little society lady in her day, now was a little old before her time and salt and pepper haired, putting on these dowdy clothes and a sweater with a patch on the sleeve. And she had to go to work so that she could pay the rent so Bill could go to the Oxford group and bring home these drunks. And he had a terrible feeling of remorse. He said, Lois, I'm so sorry. I thought that, sure, that experience was something to do with God wanting me to help drunks, but apparently not. I've been working for drunks 
for six months now and not one person has stayed sober and I'm done doing it. Now I'm going to get a job tomorrow for shoveling crap, but I'll get you out of that damn apartment, department store where you're working. And right there, your life and mine hung by a thread about that big. And uh, she said something that changed the course of history. I had lunch with her maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, up in Connecticut. And I said, Lois, how did you ever think of that answer? You saved all of our lives. She said, I don't know, it just seemed obvious to me. He said, not one person has stayed sober. And she said, you did. Said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's get one thing straight. I'm not like these other speakers you've heard. This is the sign for applause. <laughs> and this is for muffled sobs. <laughs> anyway. So he, uh, he said, oh yeah. That's why a lot of old timers don't have much hair in front. You just go through life. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But he knew something was wrong, so he went down to the doctor at the hospital that he'd been in, where the doctor knew him well. He said, Doc, you know, I've stayed sober since I was here last, but it's been almost half a year, and I, I've been trying to help people drunks, and I can't help them. I talk to them, I take them home, I work with them, none of them stay sober. The doctor said, what are you telling them, Bill? He said, I'm trying to train them to have a spiritual experience. <laughs> so you got a long way to go, Bill. It's never going to happen in this world. He said, I wish I could give you some advice, but I don't know any advice. We have no answer. We take guys like you in, we tell, talk to you. You get sober, go home. A month later, you're drunk again. Everybody we work with, nobody stays sober out of here. Yet we, we give it our best. I have no, I wish I had a solution for you, Bill, but I don't. He said, there's one thing that I thought, maybe, I have thought about. And it seems kind of strange, but, you know, alcoholics are people who seem to be encased in a clear see-through shield, but that shield prevents anything getting in, any information, any knowledge, any advice. <laughs> and that shield is composed of, but you don't understand. In my case is different. And no one ever seems to be able to get through that shield. I can't. He said, you know, maybe if you should tell these drunks that you used to be a drunk too, and that you understand, I don't understand the feelings, but you must understand how good it feels to drink and how bad it feels to not drink, and explain that you know how they feel, maybe that would help them. And Bill said, I don't conceivably see how that could happen. That it would help anybody for them to know I'm a drunk when I'm talking to them. And uh, so he went home, no answer except this dumb thing the doctor had said. And he found a letter offering him a job about this company in Akron that made rubber machine tool tools. And they, uh, they said, you know, Bill, you're staying sober. I understand you cleaned up for about half a year now. We got a deal out in Akron. We got to, meet, got to get those proxies. Go out there and get those proxies and we'll make you president of the company and you'll be on easy street for the rest of your life. And God, was he elated. Went to Akron and the deal blew up in about three days. Nothing to do with him, but he was the loser. And on a Saturday morning in May, like today, he stood in the lobby of the hotel, looked in his pocket, had a $10 bill. He could either pay his hotel bill or buy a train ticket home. He didn't want to go home because you have to go home and admit failure again. Lois, nothing's ever going to get better. He didn't want to tell her. Nobody likes to go home after they've been... F <laughs> if you're going to leave, sit in the back, for Christ's sake. <laughs> I didn't notice. I don't judge. <laughs> There's my picture. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And he stood there, I stood there maybe 30, 40 years ago trying to recreate the feelings he must have had. He stood there and it felt so bad, didn't want to go home, had no place to go. And over here was the little door 
And over the door was a little curved neon sign that said, Cocktails. And he, uh, he heard the jukebox coming out the door. And he heard the clink of glasses and the laughter of girls. And he had an idea. Do you know what it was? What a surprising attitude. If I just had a couple of drinks, I could think of an answer. <laughs> and he started to go. And every step he took was the diminishing of this crowd, I'll tell you. And then out of the corner of his eye, he saw across on the wall some, <laughs> maybe he's picketing you people right there, I don't know. <laughs> he saw some telephones on the wall. Young people, there used to be telephones on the wall. <laughs> and they were black and ugly and you, and you couldn't call her up on them. <laughs> yeah. But he remembered he'd promised to call his, in, his friends in uh, New York. He'd talk to somebody in the Oxford group before he did anything drastic. So we went over there and the small towns, hotels, they used to have a list of all the major churches and the ministers and then their phone numbers. So whatever faith, big faith you were in, you could call them. And he just took them from the top, went to the first number, called it. Guy said, hello. He said, I'm, I'm a Bill Wilson, I'm a rum hound from New York. I have to talk to somebody in the Oxford group. And the man said, I'm sorry, sir. I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm trying to write a sermon. Please don't bother me. And hung up. And he called the second number and there was no answer. And he called the third number, and there was no answer. And he called the fourth number, and the man said, I wish I could help you, but I don't know anyone in the Oxford group, sorry. And what, how about would you help? Here's what I would do if I were him. I would have said, well, I did what I said I would, but damn it, it just makes you feel worse. He started to turn away, and he noticed the last name, Walter Tunk. He thought, what kind of a day would it be if I weren't rejected by Walter Tunk? <laughs> so he called Walter Tunk. And Walter Tunk turned out to be the only man in Akron who could have helped him. One of the many, many miracles that keeps this place going. He said, funny you should call. I got a parishioner, a wealthy parishioner out in West Akron, who was telling me just yesterday that in their Oxford group, they have a doctor who this week admitted he was a drunkard and they couldn't, he couldn't stop himself. And they've all been praying for him incessantly, but he still is drunk. He said, let me see what I can do. Maybe I can call, find out how you, maybe you can get in touch with him. So he called the wealthy parishioner, gave her Bill Wilson's number in the, in the uh, phone booth. The wealthy parishioner called Mrs. Smith and said, Mrs. Smith, and she called and this is another miracle, God. And the phone rang, and rang, and rang, and rang. And as she hung it up, she heard a voice say, hello, I'm sorry I was out in the yard. Just that half a second saved our life. And she told Mrs. Smith that there was this man from New York who wanted to talk to maybe her husband. Mrs. Smith said, I'd, I'd love to have somebody talk to him, but he's laying drunk on the floor, he can't get up today. Uh, maybe tomorrow. Can we? And this woman said, all right, why don't you bring your husband out to my house tomorrow and I'll get this man from New York to come out. Maybe we can put them together, maybe help. And so uh, the wealthy parishioner called Bill back at the hotel and he was about ready to leave. He'd been waiting there and nothing ever happens. He was about to go. But he got, she got a hold of him and explained to him how he could take the streetcar out to her home the next day. And then she called Mrs. Smith and said, why don't you come out to my home at such a, at two o'clock in the afternoon, for example, and maybe we have a bite to eat and we get the, get the guys together. And so that happened the next day, which turned out to be Mother's Day, 1935. And uh, at the International Convention in New Orleans in about 1980, at the last meeting, the leader group said, we have a special guest with us today, a special guest. I'd like to introduce you Dr. Bob's son, young Bob Smith. Nobody ever heard that he'd had a son before. We, Yay! I hollered and cheered. And it turned out he was an Al-Anon. <laughs> but we liked him anyway.
And, uh, but he got to be a good friend of mine over the years. And he went around and talked to a lot. A lot of you, I'm sure a lot of you people have heard young Bob Smith talk. But he, one of his greatest moments was describing that ride out to the parishioner's house on morning of Mother's Day because his father was too hungover to drive. He was 16, so he had to drive. And his sister sat in the right front seat, and his mother and father sat in the back. And all the way out here, his father said, man, I'm not going to get, I can't stand another lecture about my drinking. I'm not going to listen anymore about my drinking. I, I do it because I spoiled Mother's Day for you, but I'm damned if I'm going to listen anymore. I can't stand any more lectures, Adam. It was all the way out there. And they got out there, and these two guys, they all sat down and had a bite to eat. And these two guys drifted off into a room for their 10 minutes and were there for four hours and came out and the doctor said to his wife, my God, Ann, that's the first man I ever talked to who seems to know how I feel and what a drink does for me and what happens to me when I try to go on the wagon. He said, my God, I thought I was the only one in the world. He said, Bill, could you, could you possibly stay over for a few days and talk to me? And Bill thought, let's see. I have no way to get out of town. Yes, I can stay over. So they talked for almost two weeks about the Oxford movement and how to enhance their spiritual growth and how they could find the love through Jesus of the God that would help them both. And uh, near the end of the second week, the doctor said to Bill, Bill, I haven't felt better in my life. Now this weekend, the American Medical Association Convention is over in, New, in uh, New Jersey, Atlantic City. And I was there last year, and I was so drunk they ridiculed me and made me feel terrible. But I want to go there this year and show them what I'm really like and show them what the Oxford Group has done for me. You stay here with my wife and kids, and I'll be home Tuesday morning. So Tuesday morning came, and early in the morning the phone rang. Mrs. Smith answered the phone, and the voice said, hello, this is the doctor's secretary, I'm so, nurse, I'm so sorry to call you, but they carried him off the train this morning so drunk he couldn't walk. And the station agent know that I worked for him, so he called me and the cab driver and I have him on the floor of his office here and he's crying, he's so sorry, but he's terribly drunk. What should I do? And Mrs. Smith said, well, just keep him there and Mr. Wilson and I will be down to pick him up and take him home. So they went down there and got this crying, sad, drunk and brought him home. I know very few things in my experience that I hate worse than crying drunks. Jesus, they're a nasty bunch. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you just want to say, now be sorry. Boom! <laughs> but they wouldn't be like me. They took him home and put him to bed. And <laughs> so much for the grand experiment of the Oxford group. And Thursday morning, he sat up and said, what day is it? He said, it's Thursday, Bob. He said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I've got to do a cancer surgery today, and I can't possibly do it. Look at my hand. I can't hold a knife. My God. They'll take my license. I've postponed this damn operation twice now. And so they got him up, and his wife and Bill, and they bathed him and got him a, dressed. And his new friend Bill got him some beer to steady his hand so he could hold the knife. And away he went. He said, I'll be home about 4 o'clock. And uh, about 2 o'clock. He said, I'll be home about 2 o'clock. And away he went. And 2 o'clock came and they waited for him. Didn't come. 3 o'clock, didn't come. 4 o'clock, didn't come. 5 o'clock, son of a bitch must be drunk again. 6 o'clock, the door threw him. So there was Bob, sober. Where you been, Bob? He said, when I was doing that surgery, it suddenly struck me. In the Oxford group, they want you to make amends to people you've harmed. And I never thought that applied to doctors. But I realized I'm a human being first and a doctor second. I've been all over Akron making amends to people, and I feel wonderful. <laughs> that was June 10th, 1935, when they called that the birthday of Alcoholics Anonymous. But they didn't know it was the birthday of alcohol. They're just two drunken pukes hanging on together. <laughs> but they realized one thing. Sitting and talking about salvation had not kept Dr. Bob sober. 
nor any of the people that Bill called on in New York. Bill happened to be the one who stayed sober because he was the one doing the calling on, apparently. So they realized it's something to do with trying to help others, maybe. That, maybe that must be it. And they knew that maybe they should help drunkards. And uh, Bill said, do you know anybody in the hospital up here that we might call on, Bob? And Bob said, no, I'll call, called up this nurse, six or three. He had, been on the, he had been on the staff there and had been removed because of his drinking. But now he called a nurse he knew well, Dr. Sister Ignatia. And she said, well, yes, let me see what I can do. Because at that time, you could not get in the hospital as a drunk. You had to have plumbing problems, something terrible involved. And drunks would not be allowed in. She said, but this man is also a drunkard. I know that, Sister Ignatia said. And let me talk to his wife and see if I can uh, maybe arrange for you two to go up and meet him. And uh, I heard that man in the bed talk later, but 10 years later, Bill D was his name. He said, I was laying in that hospital in Akron, Ohio, and my wife came and said, two men want to talk to me about my drinking. And I said, absolutely not. I'm sick of all the lectures I've got. I'm not going to hear anybody about my drinking. Don't bring anybody around here. I refuse to do it. But my wife is a rather strong woman. <laughs> so I talked to them two fellas. And they never talked about my drinking once. Not once. They talked about their drinking and how it made them feel and why they had to drink and how they felt when they didn't drink. And I thought, my God, I'm not the only one. My God, I'm not the only one. And he, he said, I stuck with them fellas, and I've been with them ever since. He became number three in the chain. And they wandered around Akron trying to get people. They'd find them, take them to the Oxford group, and then talk about drinking. And uh, kind of a sidebar here. There was a young guy, Ernie. They, he got joined up with them. Said, well, you're only 29, Ernie. You can't be an alcoholic. You're too young. But God, you sure drink like one. So you could come along with us, but, uh, but he came along with them and their silly little crests. And Ernie fell in love with Dr. Bob's daughter and brought us our first relationship. <laughs> I don't know a word that sends a shiver down a sponsor's spine like that word. <laughs> I want to talk to you about my new relationship. I know I thought the last one was it, but when I saw Margaret walking out of detox this morning, I just knew. <laughs> but they got married. It was really a wonderful thing, not like your usual AA relationships. He left me, the son of a bitch, and took my money. Uh, they got married. That happened in my family. My youngest daughter, Susan, who some of you know, married a guy five years sober that I sponsored. I thought it was a puke. <laughs> I was against the marriage, but I have a group of daughters, all who know much more than I do. So they said, just be quiet, Daddy. We'll take care of it. So they got married. And I want to tell you the absolute epitome of mixed emotions. It's watching your daughter go down the aisle to marry a man whose fifth step you've heard. <laughs> you can't really say anything because you're bound by the sacredness of the confessional. <laughs> but you can give little hints. Let me know if he ever brings a sheep home. <laughs> Well, anyway, these two got married, and they said to Ernie, now you, you're a new husband, and your new husband, I want you to stay home. Don't come around with us in our Ross, no the Oxford group, don't do nothing. Just stay home and take care of your wife down. Have a nice honeymoon. Now, so he did, and got drunk. They couldn't imagine why. And he got sober again about 50 years later, and uh, turned her against AA for the next 50 years because they didn't realize you had to keep doing it, kind of, to get out of self. But they uh, eventually got a few people in the Oxford group, and then the Oxford group 
kind of got cross with them because this little group, they call them the drunk squad or the alcoholic squad, <laughs> kept talking about drinking instead of Jesus. And so they asked him to leave and they left. In fact, there's a letter written by T. Henry Williams to them saying, we think you're trying to do a good job, but we don't know what it is. That's not our job. Our job is to help people's souls. And uh, about 40 years later, we wrote another letter saying, I'm very sorry I wrote that letter. I didn't know what you were doing. But that was when Bill went to New York, and they, uh, Dr. Bob started an AA meeting in the King School in Akron, and that ran for years and years. And uh, little by little, they, st they just had discovered the secret of Alcoholics Anonymous, although they didn't really know it. But they discovered one thing. You try, the purpose of AA is to get through that wall, that invisible wall, but my case is different. And they uh, discovered that. And that's why they said we have to, in fact, when Bill wrote the 12 steps in the first rendition of it, in the fifth tradition, he wrote the only requirement for membership is a desire to help people. And his member said, no, not people, Bill, alcoholics. We don't have any more help for people than anybody else, but we have help for alcoholics. And so they changed the word to alcoholics. And it, it gradually grew and uh, became something nice. In fact, over the years, it's kind of odd. They discovered that identification is the magic thing that makes AA work. There's many groups that have all the good words we have and all the pretty words and all the things, but we're the only one that has the identification to get through that wall. It doesn't do any good to have pretty words if they're bouncing off the outside. And the, uh, in fact, in Los Angeles, interesting, 1956, a guy named Willis, Jim Willis, uh, was a gambler and also an alcoholic. And he was bringing his gambler friends to the meetings, trying to help them. And they, we don't want to come to these meetings, as these old juicers talk. We don't, we're not drunken bums like they are, for Christ's sake, Jim. So he wrote to New York and got permission to use the 12 steps outside of a first one ever. And he founded Gamblers Anonymous and just changed the word alcohol to gamblers. So when the men came to the meetings, they could identify with what that guy was talking about. And they became the biggest and largest and most successful of the non-AA groups. And then some two guys in the North Hollywood clubhouse trying to help narcotics addicts stay sober, clean, and they wouldn't listen to anybody. So they got permission to use the 12 steps and founded Narcotics Anonymous. Then a few months later, out in the west part of town, in the wealthy part of town, some cocaine addicts couldn't get their fellow cocaine addicts sober in AA. So they got the permission to form Cocaine Anonymous. And mid-Wilshire, some women got together and formed Overeaters Anonymous. They are the first, they are the big four of non-AA groups. And they were all created so that some goof could identify with what the speaker was talking about. And I never really understood it. Well, I was about two years sober. But for, I've been slipping for years. Now it's two years sober, all of a sudden, God, I was doing good. <laughs> Still had no front teeth, had been kicked out in the Phoenix jail. But I, was, I wasn't hitting his consonants quite as cleanly as I might have. <laughs> but I was talking at the club one day on the sickness of alcoholic emotions, not the recovery from them. I hadn't got to that point yet. But I knew about the emotions. I talked about it. And, um, this kind of plump woman came up and said, I've never heard anyone describe those emotions before. I think I have those emotions too. She said, would you mind coming and speaking to my group? It's called Overeaters Anonymous over at the Christ the King Church on Olympic Boulevard. I said, no. <laughs> I weighed about 130 pounds, <laughs> gaunt. Give them something to shoot for. <laughs> and I went over there and spoke at their groups about eight fat women sitting around a room. But I gave them a wonderful talk on the emotions. They all went. <laughs> and I sat down and I thought, boy, I've really helped them. And then they had a little sharing session and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. A woman over here, her son had just turned 10 a couple days before that. 
She sent her husband down to the military academy in Long Beach where he was. She got the cake ready for them, took a taste to make sure it was good, took another taste, another taste. By the time they got back, she'd eaten the whole cake. And I, I didn't say anything because I'm too nice a guy, but I want to say, just have a piece of cake for Christ's sake and stop. What are you doing? <laughs> Woman back there talking about it. She was crazed for ice cream. She didn't feel empowered enough. She had a lot of ice cream. She couldn't wait for her husband to go to work in the morning, the surgeon. So she'd get down and get some Rite Aid to get some more ice cream and eat. Just, mm. She just feels strength surging into her body. Mm. Get to be a problem for you. Hide all the cases, containers. And I didn't say anything because I'm too nice a guy. But I wanted to say, no wonder you're fat for Christ's sake. That's what happens when you eat all that ice cream. The woman over here was my champion, though. She ate till she couldn't eat anymore, and then she put her finger down her throat and vomited it up so she could eat some more. And I didn't say anything, because I'm a nice guy. But I wanted to say, don't bother shaking hands with me after the meeting. I can see doing that for drinking, but not eating. No. I've done it for drinking a lot. My God, Saturday afternoon, sun's still up. Shit. Now, what was the difference? I've got a good brain, but I didn't identify. It was just all foreign behavior to me. That's what you got to remember when you try to describe it. You wonder why your family can't understand alcoholism, because they don't identify with it. They, can't un they, they try to. But, you know, even your mother will say, you mean you can't even have a glass of wine at Christmas? No. I have an aunt who used to say to me, <laughs> when I was about 10 years old, she'd say, are you still going to those meetings? Haven't you learned how to stay sober yet? And I, I couldn't think of an answer. <laughs> I finally thought of an answer, because she was very religious. I said, are you still going to church? Haven't you learned about Jesus yet? Uh, sure, yeah. She never asked me any more questions about that. In fact, come to me, she never talked to me again, now that I think about it. <laughs> that was okay. You'll notice the other speakers up here are drinking out of bottled water. My host sees that I have a cup of coffee, cream sugared and saucered and blowed. Thank you. Um, that's you, you, thank you. But the whole point of all this oper operation is this. Somehow or other, it has been, we've over the years learned that we, uh, we have to carry the message of identification. The, uh, some years ago, 1963, I was about four or five years sober, and I had a job and they sent me to New York to do something or other. And, uh, I had a morning free, and I thought, I'm going to go over and talk to Bill Wilson. So I'd heard him talk at the International Convention in 1960. Incidentally, I should say one other thing. In 1960, that story about Sister Ignatia, I heard Sister Ignatia tell that story. At the, and I went up afterwards, and I was just very impressed. Got it. Here's a voice from, and I shook hands with her, and I gave her a kiss on the cheek. I thought, oh, that, maybe that's wrong. And I, I think I said, I'm sorry, I'm, maybe I should have kissed you on the cheek. And I think she said, as long as you don't get in the habit. <laughs> I can't remember exactly. That's a long time ago. I can't remember every word 60 years ago, for Christ's sake. When I went over to see Bill Wilson in, in the office on 44th Street, and the girl said, oh, he's booked up for three weeks in advance, all day, every day. I can get you in three weeks. I said, well, I won't be here, never mind. So I went to the archives, and I was looking for small pictures and stuff, and very fascinating. And here comes Bill Wilson. He said, are you the young man who want to talk to me? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, my 11 o'clock didn't show up. Come on in. So I sat and talked to Bill Wilson for an hour. And you know what he said? I don't remember. 
I was more concerned what he thought about me than what he was saying. God, the only thing I remember him saying is that I said to him, last week at our group in Los Angeles, Bill, we were doing, going through working with others in the book, and you talk about how you identify with them and how to make them feel like you identify with them, but you never once make them t suggest taking them to a meeting. Don't you people ever take people to meetings? He said, young man, when I wrote that, there were no meetings. He sent a shiver down my spine. Just think of that. I have to work with a guy all week, take him to a religious meeting where they say, I don't want to hear this crap and go get drunk. As the, that's how they grew very slowly. So finally the Oxford group got rid of them against their will and made them be Alcoholics Anonymous, which saved us all. You people are really trained well, I'll say that. You anticipate I'm going to smooth my hair. But the history of Alcoholics Anonymous all, you know, you can find AA stuff in any lot of books. There's all of our words and spiritual behavior and all those sorts of things. And uh, somebody sends out a copy of all the books Dr. Bob had on his bookcase of religious books. Never, they don't even remember. He couldn't get sober. He just had a bunch of religious books. But finally, what makes us different is that you and I if the situation is right, I can get through that wall and explain to you things that if I, from the outside, just boom, 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 falling off. The, other, the doctor says, here's what you ought to do. Boom. Thanks, doc, I really appreciate that. Boom, boom. Thanks a lot, I really understand that. But people like us can get through that wall and say, my God, maybe you understand. Wouldn't that be something? I know I slipped for 10 years. I'll tell you something. Ebby, you know, never could stay sober. Bill's sponsor. In 1953, he just came off with another terrible drunk. And Bill said was in Dallas. There was a guy there named Cersei. And Cersei was famous all over for helping slippers. And he went down there, and he kept Ebby sober. And Ebby stayed sober for seven years. And Bill was so thrilled, he had him talk at the 1960 International Convention, the only time he ever talked to the convention. And I sat there and listened to him. I was thrilled. And Bill got up and said, I'd like to introduce my sponsor, Ebby. And they kind of put the note of official approval on him. And he gave a good talk. Then he went back to Texas. But he, he never could quite stand to take advice from a guy he'd helped, Bill, apparently. And he was just irate. He said, those jerks in Los Angeles, they gave him much more attention than they gave me, and I'm his sponsor. He never seemed to realize he didn't stay sober. And he brooded about that for about six months, then got drunk again. And Bill had to come down to Texas and take him home, and put him in an assisted living home in New York where he died. But it's just an amazing thing that of all people who should have stayed sober, it should have been Ebby. And there's a great school of thought that Phil Rolden, the guy who went to see Dr. Jung, that he died drunk years later. He wouldn't go to AA. He wouldn't go near AA. And uh, whether he did or not makes no difference. But there's a lesson to be learned here that somehow we have to get through that wall because we get trapped in that wall. We're alone and lonely. One of the great curses is that when you are like that, everybody around you turns into a jerk little by little, until you get so sick of all the jerks, you have to drink to stand it. And you say, why did you drink? It's a sad thing. I bet everybody in this room, somewhere along the line, has seen the face of someone who loves them, saying, oh, how could you? You promised, and look at you now. The children are so upset. How could you do that? You promised, you put your hand on the Bible and promised and now you're drunk. And you know what the answer to that is? Leave me alone. Because I don't know either. Get off my back. Screw you. I'm getting out of here. It's a sad thing. Why does anybody act like that? We don't know. But that's the way we act. And so what we got to remember is you and I have been blessed with a blessing 
that's never been given to psychiatrists or doctors or ministers or priests or anybody else. A way to get through that wall where maybe we can help them understand that they're not alone. Because the purpose of AA, I always remember this, it was mentioned briefly by the speaker this afternoon, the young lady from the grapevine. Alcoholics Anonymous is exactly the same in Minneapolis today as it was in Akron, Ohio in 1935. It is always the same, and we have to be part of it. One alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to help him lower his feelings of being different at least enough so that he will take an action he does not yet believe in. And when that moment comes, that's the ember of sobriety. <sighs> then you kind of blow on it. <sighs> and you try to surround yourself by people going in the same direction, stay away from scoffers and sneerers. And eventually you keep doing the things and pretty sure you get a little fire in you. Okay, you don't need a, and eventually you stay sober. And it's easy staying sober. I've been sober, I noticed last night, I was the longest in the room, I stood up and I was getting tired. But I, uh, you know, they said, Isn't, how do you stay sober 55 years? I'll tell you the secret. We're, come on, we're out of time. Stop that. They won't take me if I'm over time. But I'll tell you how you stay sober. You go to meetings. You try to help people if you can. Some, it's the irony of AA, the ones you really want to stay sober, don't stay sober, the ones that you wish didn't do. <laughs> it's the damnedest thing you ever saw. But you take credit for all of them anyway. You stay sober and you try to help people and you try to do the things you learned in your first few months. I think the secret of alcoholics, that was, we always teach them, I was teaching newcomers is this, for your first few months, here's all you have to know. Do what you said you would do. Be where you said you would be, when you said you would be there. Don't take out your hostility on people who can't answer back, waiters and waitresses, subordinates. And on days you're having a bad day, shut your mouth. Because without even being aware of it, you can cut people to ribbons. So you just keep your mouth shut and say, Come on, midnight. Come on, midnight. <laughs> and pretty soon you've been sober a long time, and it's worth every second of it. Thank you.